Hey everybody, welcome on in to Clayshare Day. We've got our second demo lined up for you. We have Todd Hickerson from Mako. He's gonna be joining us and he's gonna be sharing some stroke and coat tutorial ideas. And you know how much I love my stroke and coats and I've got the Mako stroke and coat test plate we did recently. And then we've been making all kinds of things with stroke and coats the last month. So if you want to see more Stroke & Co. awesomeness after this tutorial, go check out what we got on Clayshare. But right now we're going to go hang out with Todd from Mako. So let's go see what he has happening in the studio. Hey, Todd. Hey, Todd. Hi, thanks for inviting me. Um, Thank so, you so much for being here. Oh, you're welcome. So one of my jobs at Mako is technical support. So I get the questions um, fed to me either by email or by phone um, on how products work. and there is a big uh, misunderstanding a lot with a lot of customers on what Stroke & Co actually is and how to use it. So that's what we're going to go over today is how the Stroke & Coats work and what they are. So Stroke & Coats are, they're a heavy pigmented glaze line um, and they're very viscous. viscous. Uh, you can see here what I'm talking about. If I pour it out, oh, first I got to take the lid off, take the little wrapper off. You get a brand new bottle, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice and thick. So that means it's gonna brush on and stay nice and wet um, for much longer than if your, your glaze was a uh, really thin glaze. Um, it's a broad firing range. So you can see in front of me, um, the glazes first at cone 06, cone six, and cone 10. So it's got a very, very wide firing range and the colors stay true, pretty true, all the way up to cone 10. Um, and you can see that we have a very large color palette of the stroking coats. If you go online, this is what you're gonna, how it's gonna look. You're gonna see the color at 06 and you're gonna see the color at cone six. So this is our large palette range of colors. But if one of these colors doesn't fit exactly what you want, stroke and coats are 100% intermixable. So um, that allows the artist to make their own color palette, uh, create their own custom shades. Um, it can be used like a watercolor. So here's a good example of the stroke and coats being used as a watercolor. Thinning it out just with a little bit of water. And the more, um, the more you use it, with uh, more you thin it with water, the more translucent it becomes. Same with if you use one coat compared to two coats to, compared to three coats, the translucency. Um, three coats is gonna be an op opaque coverage. You can see here the very vivid colors and the very opaque coverage. Um, you can do light over dark. So that what I mean by that is you can apply a white uh, the white cotton tail over top of the black tuxedo and it's going to stay white. It's not going to turn gray. Um, one misconception that a lot of people have of what stroke and coats are is that they're an underglaze. They are not an underglaze. So an example of an underglaze uh, are wild violet underglaze. This is what it looks like without a clear glaze over top of it. And here we put a clear glaze over. So stroke and coats, they will be glossy um, straight out of the bottle. You do not need to use the clear, um, clear coat over top of them. However, uh, a lot of people do use a clear coat, which it will work fine. Because um, if you do glaze some parts of your piece and leave some parts um, unglazed, then you could dip the whole piece inside of a um, bucket of clear or brush the clear on. And the clear is not going to affect the stroke and coats. Um, how, am I how am I doing, Jessica? I'm going really you're doing, fast. And... You're doing great. You're, you're going through it. So um, you just answered a question. Some folks were asking if they thin the stroke and coat for that watercolor effect, do they need to put a clear on top? And you did answer, you, yes, you can. Yes, you, you should put a clear then over top of it if you thinned it out like a watercolor. So the example here with the giraffe, it's been thinned out a whole lot with water. And then this whole piece is done with clear over top of it. 
And will they run at cone six? So if someone uses it so, full strength at cone yeah, six. Yeah, I was I'm they... going to get into that a little bit later. Okay. Um, so but, we well, I'll just do it right now. So uh, we were. the question was, will it run at cone six? I don't recommend using the stroke and coats at cone six for design work. So what I mean by design work, um, clean, crisp line work. If you want to do clean, crisp lines, you don't want to use stroke and coats at cone six because they're going to get fuzzy. So here, I don't, I can get close, but you can see the lines um, where the orange and the blue come together. It's very fuzzy. And that's what's going to happen at cone six because at cone six, the stroke and coats now are melting a lot more and they're blending together. Um, so can stroke and coats go to cone 10? Yes, yeah, so here, 06, cone 6, cone 10, 06, 6, 10. So you can see with the uh, moody blue, there's almost no difference between 06 and cone 10. You couldn't tell the difference. Wow, that's a great firing range. Um, also, we have uh, speckles in the stroke and coats. So here you can see an example of speckles being added into the stroke and coats. Um, also, you can use the stroke and coats in a myolic kind of technique. So thinning it down with water and placing it over top of uh, white glaze. It won't run if you're firing at low fire, 06. At cone six, I would not recommend doing this type of technique at cone six or it'll get fuzzy around the edges. Um, you can also, uh, the, the stroke and coats are very opaque. So you can see doing three coats using a dark clay body or a terracotta clay body, the clay body is not gonna show through. It's going to be opaque. And that actually and, leads me to this question we have. Yeah. If someone does two coats, is that food safe or do you have to have the three coats to be food safe? The glaze is always gonna be food safe because food safe means it doesn't have any um, cadmium or lead in it, but will it be dinnerware safe? So that all depends upon the application of the glaze, how thick it was applied, the, if it was fired, on, uh, fired to the correct temperature, and if it was um, uh, fired to the correct temperature on the right type of clay body and the, the right amount of glaze applied. So whether or not it's food safe or not, um, yes, it'll be food safe because it doesn't have any lead or cadmium, but dinner was safe, that's dependent on the application and the firing. Thank you. Yep. Um, you may also use put the, the glaze on the stroking coat on wet clay. So you can be fire or throwing your piece on the wheel and apply the stroking coat just like a slip. And you can um, do once fire with that. So that's safe for often people save money um, and time by only doing a once fire. So they apply the, the stroking coat on greenware wet and let it dry and they skip the bisque firing, they bisque the fire all just one time up to cone 06 or to cone six. Here's an example of the stroke and coat done in Scrafito. So it was applied wet when it was thrown and then come back and carve the stroke and coat away. So if you start with one color stroke and coat and you don't have enough of the same color that you're using, can you use another color? just go in with another layer of a different color? Sure, yeah, they can be over top of each other, different colors um, layered, yes. And that, um, um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, that, in that example, you know, we had a bunch of people asking about this graffito, and so would you would do a clear on top of that after it's bisque? You don't need to or do a no? clear, no. If, no. If, I put, if I put three coats of the purple on, then there's no need to put a clear over top of it. If I did one coat of each of these colors, then I would apply a clear over the entire piece. That's how this one was done. It was done with uh, one coat, one nice thick coat of each color, then scrafitoed, and then the clear over top. Thank you.
Um, so most everything I've been talking about so far has been firing the stroking coats at 06 or cone 04 low fire. However, the stroking coats um, have now, and Jessica knows this, using them at cone six, you're going to get a lot more movement and um, more interesting interaction happening. So an example, the hot tamale and the moody blue. So this glaze and this glaze were applied dripped over top of birch glaze. And it gets this nice movement going on. Same with here, we have moody blue drips all the way around over top of capri blue. Hey, Jessica, I'm kind of running out of things to talk about. Well, how about you tell us the difference between food safe and uh, dinnerware safe or dinnerware appropriate is what I like to use instead of safe because it's the appropriate, there's a safety issue and there's an appropriate yeah, issue, I feel, did, between the two. Food safe is a legal term that's um, regulated for whether the glaze leaches any lead or cadmium. So none of our glazes in the Mako line is going, or I'm sorry, all of our glazes in the Mako line are food safe because they do not leach any lead or cadmium. Dinnerware safe depends on whether you're applying the glaze to a clay body that is the right type of clay body. So we wouldn't want to apply the stroking coats on a earthenware clay body and fire it to cone six. Cause then it's the clay body is not being fired to the right temperature. Or I wouldn't want to apply the stroking coats onto a cone 10 clay body and only fire it to cone 06. Then the clays isn't being fired to the right temperature on the right clay body. So it's ma matching the clay body with the correct glaze that clay body, firing it to the right temperature. There should be no surface irregular, irregularities. So an example of that would be a crackle glaze. It has surface irregularities where food can go down inside of pores and you can't clean it well. Um, a texture glaze such as our magma glaze that we do not recommend for food safe, or I'm sorry, for dinnerware safe because of the texture it has, it's gonna absorb um, food. The other thing a part of, uh, about whether it's dinnerware safe is the hardness of the glaze. So a few of our glazes are soft glazes. And what I mean by that is an example would be mirror black or um, uh, Himal Himalayan salt. These glazes have a, are soft. And if you use orange juice or Coca-Cola um, coffee, that acid can eat away into those glazes and deteriorate the glaze um, over time. It's not going to leach any lead or cadmium, so it's still food safe, but it's not recommended for dinnerware safe because of uh, the softness of the glaze, the acid eats away at it. Right. Yeah, and so it's, um, and if you want more on that, I have actually classes on both of those on ClayShare that I address that issue because it is, it's an important, and I think people get confused with the difference between food safe and dinnerware safe or appropriate because it, that's really what we're Correct. talking about is the appropriateness yeah. of, of a glaze. And, so, and the thing with that, I mean, it's it's hard for me to actually tell you whether it's dinnerware safe or not because you have to know all the factors that go into it. So really if dinnerware safe is up to the user to make sure it's dinnerware safe. It's, you can't just call Mako and ask, hey, is this piece dinnerware safe? Um, you have to know what all went into the making of the piece. Right. I mean, all you can do as a company is test the product and make sure that it's not leaching um, lead or cadmium and that it's safe for use. It just might not be the best choice um, for using. So we have a question about using stroke and coats with underglazes. Can you put an underglaze on on top of the stroke and coat and will it stick, craze or flake off? It's going to have a tendency to flake off. Yes, if you put the, uh, the underglaze on top of the stroke and coat, you have a, uh, a chance of it to crack off. Um, now you could do the opposite, put the underglaze down and then put a stroke and coat on top of that. And it's going to most likely be work fine for you. 
And uh, we had a, someone was asking, how, how can a person know which glaze is soft or not? Like, how are they to tell? We have it online or yeah. on, the, on the bottle. It it'll, should say that mm -hmm. this is not recommended for dinnerware safe. And then also online, you can find out. And if you have a question, then you send it to me, send it to a technical Mako and I'll answer it for you. Yeah, you but can it always email. Be, it should be on the bottle put, and it's I'll also online. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I'll, I'll share I'll share your email, Todd, with everybody so that yeah, they sure. can have that and they can reach out to you if they have any technical questions. Because, I mean, we I think as far as uh, with any glaze product, we could open up for questions and we could be here till tomorrow and probably not get them all answered because yeah. there's always so many questions for glazing. Um, so going back to using stroke and coats at cone 10, you're just going to see uh, a lot more movement. Uh, but 10. not it, it's not not really a lot more movement. So it's not going to uh, run off the bottom of the pot. No, not at all. Like there really is very very little movement. Um, it's the combination of adding it on top of another glaze that gives it the movement. But using it by itself, there isn't a whole lot of movement at all, even at cone ten. So I could glaze so really right, right up to the bottom movement. of my piece, leaving just you know quarter of an inch, um, and with hot tamale and it's going to stay put there at cone 10. Ah, uh -huh. folks want to know more about using flux with stroke and coats. Yeah, so this is an example of using the flux um, with stroke and coats. So it's got light flux and the moody blue over top of this nice capri blue. Um, what do they want to know about? Like how to how it to do it or I they just said will you talk more about using flux on stroking okay. coats? <laughs> so there's lots piece, of different ways to apply it, you know, like yeah, the application. There's all different ways. Um, this one would have done by putting dots of the the flux and then dots of the moody blue stroking coat just right around the rim, just alternating back and forth, back and forth around the rim, fired to cone six. Right, and so if you had applied it by maybe just brushing on the rim, like a band along the rim, the way the flux is going to yeah. melt is going to give you a completely different effect than Correct. what has Correct. happened on that bowl. Yes, if, if I would have done it all the way around um, the rim with a brush, um, not, not making dots, but a smooth, even application, um, three coats, it would, have, would not have had all these lines coming down through it. Um, I have a, a question about the stroke and coat with speckles. This person's speckles aren't yeah. showing up very well and they wonder why. Um, are you, if they're firing at cone six, the speckles, some of the speckles do burn away at cone six. So you'll see that um, the speckles can show at 06, but at cone six, a few of those speckles in the glaze could burn away. So now you're down, there might've been four speckles in the glaze and two of them burn away. So you're only seeing two of the speckles left at cone six. And the, uh, yeah. the best way to figure out which ones burn away, I don't, um, without me saying that you can just go online and they'll have a picture side by side it shows what the results look like at six or 06 and at six, and you can see which ones have the speckles that burn away. Fantastic, so- And if they, uh, if question... they burn away at cone six, they're gonna definitely burn away at cone 10. <laughs> right, right, yeah, because they're already going at six, then if yeah. you go hotter, yeah. it's gonna definitely go away. So you had mentioned using white over black. Um, yes. So would you need a really thick coat of white onto the black to get that? Yeah, if, if you do three show... coats of, if you do three coats of white over, say at first I applied um, three coats of black to this bowl, and then I would want to write my name in white. If I did three coats of white, it's going to be white. It's not going to turn gray. The white is opaque enough to cover up the black. And then we have uh, a question about Maolica. Could you explain how that works? Yeah, so this base would have been done with um, three coats of the white cotton tail stroking coat. And then 
using various um, stroking coats, thinning them out with a little bit of water, applied brushwork for the flowers and for the leaves. Um, just a thin coat, and that's kind of gives you that myolica effect. And then could you put a clear on a glaze to make it dinner safe? Back to that uh, dinnerware appropriate issue. So if someone had a glaze, well, it um, um, like they're using the magma, could they put clear on top of the magma to make it dinnerware safe or any other glaze? It, that well, it's going to be dinnerware. It's, it, it'll still be food safe. It's not going to be dinnerware safe because by putting a clear over the magma, it's still going to be a textured glaze. The glaze still has a lot of texture to it. Um, so if, if you put a clear over a crackle glaze, often the crackle won't do its job crackling anymore. You're, you're, you're combining two different glazes, so it's no longer um, doing the purpose it was supposed to. That, that crackle might not crackle. So really, it's hard to put a clear glaze over something you're trying to make it food safe, or sorry, dinnerware safe. And is there much difference between a cone five versus cone six firing with the results? So the temperature, it's only like 50 degrees difference, but the results can be greatly different. Um, we fire all of our pieces to a cone six, um, a strong cone six. So that means the, the, the uh, cone is bending up down. And there can be a very large difference in the outcome, the the look, the finish of a piece at cone five to cone six. So you, when you look at our samples, they're all done at cone six or at cone 10. Um, they're not, we don't do samples at cone five. They're very close though. I think you wouldn't see um, much of a difference, possibly some of the colors well, that- with, I'm sorry, with the stroking coats, the stroking coats are very but, similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, th I'm talking stoneware, I was so, sorry. I, Branched off was thinking. We can about talk stone about stoneware too. People got all, people but, got all kinds of questions. All but, kinds of yeah, questions. Uh, the stroking coats, you won't see any any difference at all at cone five to cone six. I'm sorry, um, but <laughs> with stoneware glazes, yes, you can see a difference. Right. Some. I mean, I I I fired a five, and when I use the stoneware glazes, I don't get as much movement as some folks will get at six, and it makes it it yeah. does make a big difference in, in the end result. Still get great results at five but right. just got to keep that in it's mind. just different. Okay. Yeah. So can you take your stroking coats and thin them down and spray them on? Yes, you can. Um, and I know a lot of artists that do that. Yes. So we were just having a little tutorial with uh, Delvin Good and he was spraying on an underglaze product, but you could thin your stroking coat and do a very similar technique. Correct. Just that. realize that, that um, it, It'll be glossy still, even with one coat, it can be glossy. So it's not like an underglaze. Right, right. So, um, and here's a great question. Folks are asking, um, you know, if they email you, how long does it take to hear back? Because I think you and I were talking about how overwhelmed we all are in the pottery industry right sure. now. There is, we are all inundated with questions and comments and just um everything going on which is great for the industry because there's so many people interested right. in pottery right now it just means people have to be a little patient um and that can take a little yeah. longer to, to, well, to reply a, a misconception too is like that we're this huge company <laughs> and mako's not a huge company we have about 50 employees um i'm a one-man show when it comes to technical for um stoneware so i get you know many many emails every day and many phone calls and i get to them as soon as i possibly can and but technical is not my only job it's also design so i'm working in the studio making the beautiful pieces you get to see online um i'm also out on the road traveling uh doing workshops so get to them we say 24 hour no, or 24 hours but that's uh, 24 hours from when i actually read the email i'll respond back to you yeah i think we all are are very small companies and uh folks um are used to big corporations and the pottery industry has always been small mom and pops for yeah forever basically and there's just a few people doing everything 
and the new folks that are just coming to pottery aren't used to this and so it just takes a little longer um yeah. So here's an interesting question. Some folks are asking, could you take a cone six clay, put stroke and coat on it and fire it to cone six? Yes, definitely. So <laughs> you, can, you can take the stroke and coat to cone six, you can put it on a cone, but make sure whatever clay you're using matches what cone you're firing to. So don't right. use your low fire clay and fire it at cone 10. Correct. <laughs> that could end terribly in the kiln. And so there's now a flood of questions and we're not gonna be able to get to them all because we only got a, two okay. more minutes. Um, but it's, it's crazy. So can you use a stroke and coat on the clay that's not been bisque and single fire it? So could you yes. use it on greenware and do a single fire? Yes, yeah, so you can do single fire, once fire. And I know um, a couple wood fire people too that you know, they do it one fire in the wood, in the wood kiln. Yeah, and um, I've used them actually in Raku too. So you can Raku yeah. a stroke and coat as well. So Correct. is there a stroke and coat poster for folks to get at home? And if so, how can they get it? Um, contact me. <laughs> now you really, <laughs> I did post his email, <laughs> folks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, we, we have we have the stroke and coat posters, um, but the best and quickest way to get them would be go to your local distributor and hopefully ask them, they should have them. If they don't have them, they can order them and then um, you can pick it up there. And then uh, a question about availability. Are you seeing a difference in the availability of Mako products currently? Availability, whether they're at, well. Um, well, like shortages, we, we, are you? Are yeah, you, we're, we're are having raw, we issues? are having raw material issues. Um, it's been a challenge. It's been a real challenge. Um, yeah. We're, we we are yeah. about it at a about 75 to 80 percent fill. I think um, we're going to talk about that a little later today, folks, if you're interested in the uh, supply availability with Clayscapes Pottery, when they are, they're going to come on and do some mixed thing glazes, but they're also going to talk about what's been going on in the industry as far as being able to getting, getting materials. So just if, if you guys all have questions, you can save them for them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, so we got about a minute left. I can do one more question. Let's see, not to get off topic, what are the glazes on the pieces over your right shoulder beside the jar of glazes? That is way off topic. That's a whole nother, um, those are stoneware glazes and we're talking stroke and coats. So we can't do that right now, but um, so that would be way off. They're cool though. And we have talked about, um, during Clay Share Con, Carmen did a great show and tell session. So we folks might want to check that out and you can yeah. you can see, um, we'll have to have Todd come back and do a stoneware glaze info. Quickly, could you tell us what, yeah. what stroke and coats are on that plate in front of you? Um, yes. Yes. That's, we'll All end right, with so this that. Is, this is uh, stroke and coat 33, which is a fruit of the vine. Stroke and coat 29, which is bluegrass. And those are under, those, so those were applied first, trailed, and then applied abalone over top of it. Abalone is a stoneware glaze. So it's stoneware 143 was applied over the entire piece after I did the dots with the stroke and coats. Fantastic. All right. Wow. 30 minutes never went so fast. <laughs> Todd, thank you so much for being here and joining thank us you for, for inviting me. Day as we celebrate. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for all of your questions you have. Now, I did share Todd's email. So you can email him any questions you have. I know you have more questions. I saw them. I saw them in the chat. I'm so I'm moderating the chat on ClayShare, on the ClayShare Facebook page, and on the ClayShare YouTube page. So amongst all those pages, there's a lot of questions happening and we sadly don't have enough time to get to them all, but you can email Todd and you can ask him your questions. Just keep in mind, it's just him and he has to answer them all. Um, so it could take a little while. So please have patience.
<laughs> All right. Um, now, if you're looking for more information on stroke and coats, we did a whole bunch of stroke and coat live tutorials back in May. I also have quite a few classes on Clayshear where we did the peacock technique with stroke and coat. We've done a lot with using fluxes with the stroke and coats and a lot of really great Maiolica techniques too, and Scrofido and Mishima. So if you want to know about those things, check out what we got on Clayshear. Now, we're going to take a tiny break and we're going to be back with Debbie Dela Cruz from De La Designs. She has taken my Wheel Throne Magic Shaker class and designed a template and done a hand-built version. Something people have been asking for years to happen is finally happening. So come back and join us. That is going to be at 11.45 a.m. Eastern. I will see you all back then.